Today's video features three stories about the most terrifying kind of killer. It's silent, it's pretty much undetectable to the normal human, and most importantly, it can be deadly. This is Red Rum, a series of unfortunate events. These bonus episodes are just like your usual weekly episodes of Red Rum, but shorter. So usually you'll get three stories that all have a similar theme. Picture this, a quiet village where animals stagger and die, and people, healthy, the young, the old, they suddenly just start to lose control of their bodies, twisting in certain ways, their voices are slurring, their limbs contorting as if by some dark force. And no one can explain what it is, but this sickness spreads, eventually completely taking over the village. The question that everyone was asking was what was it that was hiding in plain sight that was looking to kill everybody. In the early 1950s, the residents of Minamata, Japan, began to notice these peculiar changes around them. Strange things were happening to the animals at first. Birds would be mid-flight and they would just sort of lose their balance and plummet towards the ground. Dogs and cats would convulse and in an eerie phenomenon locals began calling the dancing cat disease, cats would stagger in circles before twitching uncontrollably and then just collapsing on the ground. And then humans started showing these symptoms too. Now it began quite subtly, maybe a shake in the hand, a sort of clumsy step, maybe even just a misplaced word but the symptoms progressed, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They would turn tremors into severe spasms with quite um, noticeable rigidity. Now, one day, a young girl called Tomoko Kawamoto experienced a severe convulsion when she was just out playing. Now, her family was obviously incredibly concerned and they began to panic, so they rushed her straight to the hospital. But doctors were baffled. They just could not figure out what was going on. At first, they thought maybe this was some kind of virus. And beyond that, they wondered if it was some sort of neurological disorder or even some kind of toxin that she had accidentally somehow ingested. But the truth of the matter was that even with all of the tests they were running, nothing was brought back as conclusive or even sort of giving them a hint as to what this might be. And so they weren't really able to treat her. As Tomoko's symptoms grew worse, other people in the local town began to experience a similar kind of illness. And it was at this point that villagers started to whisper about a mysterious curse that had seemingly gripped the entire town. It seemed that those affected lost control of their limbs, they might struggle to speak, and some people even became paralyzed. Physicians called it an unknown disease of the nervous system, but as you can imagine, that really didn't do much to help allay the fears of the people in the town. And so, years pass by, and this disease just becomes known as the Minamata disease. But to be honest, the real horror behind that, what was happening, was yet to be revealed. Eventually, it was traced back to Minamata Bay, where it was discovered that for decades, the Chiso Corporation had just been dumping their waste from their chemical plant into this body of water. The toxin accumulated in fish and shellfish, and that was a primary source of food for the residents, so they were often consuming this poisoned fish. People were essentially ingesting high levels of mercury, which was just absolutely destroying their nervous system. For Tomoko's family, and for hundreds of other residents in Minamata, this discovery brought, I guess, heartbreaking clarity, but it didn't really do much for them. The damage was already done and it was irreversible. Minamata disease, as it was called, became a kind of symbol of corporate negligence. Eventually, it did force environmental and human rights reforms that would go way beyond the borders of Japan. But for families like the Kawamotos, the tragedy served as a kind of permanent reminder of how something as invisible and hidden as toxic waste could destroy families, friends, and in fact, an entire community. It changed their lives forever. Imagine stepping into a valley where the air can kill you. Throughout the mid-1900s, locals ventured into this particular valley in groups on their own, and many of them never returned. It quickly gained the nickname, the Valley of Death, and eventually, the deadly secret they uncovered was revealed to everyone. 
And it was something that means to this day, visits to this particular valley are restricted, but people continue going and people continue to disappear. In the heart of Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula lies a, an ominous and almost mythical place and it's known as Valley of Death. It was in the 1930s in the eastern part of the peninsula that two hunters came across a dried up deserted land with no plants and no greenery around it and it was covered in the bodies of dead animals and dead birds. There were foxes, there were even bears just lying there dead. Now, what they found odd about this was that there was no sign of struggle, certainly external injury or any kind of disease. The animals appeared to have simply collapsed and died on the floor. After several minutes of being in this area, the pair of explorers started to experience some headaches and they decided that because of this, they didn't know what was going on and they would just leave and maybe come back another day. Now this decision ultimately did save their lives. But the thing is, when these two people returned to the village and told people what had happened, it sparked a kind of curiosity and this curiosity would continue through the next 10, 20, 30 years with many adventurers actually making their way to this area, to this valley in a bid to solve the mystery. But of all the people who went searching, oftentimes they wouldn't return. By the 1970s, it was well known by the locals that if you wanted to come back alive, you'd avoid that area at all costs. All in all, it was estimated that over 80 people had left for the valley and never returned. And then, in 1975, a Russian expedition team decided they needed to know more. They wanted to study what was happening there. What was it that made this so dangerous? The research group gathered up their equipment, their bits of gear, their supplies, and they were generally pretty positive about their exhibition ahead. They were excited to venture into this kind of unknown world and try and discover what secrets it held. But the locals were concerned they knew that even hunters who literally went out into the wilderness all of the time, they wouldn't even stray too close to this area. But this team of researchers, driven uh, by ambition, by wanting to know whatever it was, they kind of dismissed these worries and went into this area of the valley. Now, as they went further and further into the valley, they were surrounded by fields that seemed just lifeless. Even though there was green lusciousness around them, there were particular areas in the valley that were just completely dead. And as they got further inside, they began to notice an unnerving number of animal carcasses. There were birds, there were foxes, small mammals. And again, they were just scattered on the ground as if one minute they'd been walking and then suddenly they'd just died. This felt more than strange, it felt wrong. And this kind of creeping sense of dread started to settle in. As they continued, some team members reported feeling unsteady, dizzy, short of breath. One of the geologists just thought that perhaps it was the altitude or even just fatigue from the journey, but the disorientation and the nausea grew worse by the hour. The team uncovered that the valley of death had this silent, invisible killer that was toxic gases that were seeping from the earth. Carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, both what can come from volcano activity, were present. And what happens in this particular area is that they concentrate in pockets in the ground. They sort of pull and sink low to the ground. And this means that those areas have extremely concentrated kind of pools of this. So without warning, the air around the animals could be life-giving, normal air, but as they got further to the ground or into those sort of spots where it was concentrated, it would become toxic and deadly. The stillness of the valley meant that those toxins could just sit unmoving and completely undetectable to your normal person or animal passing by. Today, the Valley of Death is largely restricted and it's marked off to just prevent people from wandering into it. The eerie stories surrounding it have persisted, especially as some explorers who are just fascinated by its mystery, occasionally they attempt to visit the valley despite all of the warnings nearby. It's not known the exact number of people who have died from venturing there, but the number continues to grow with people visiting it every single year. This story reminded me of the M. Night Shyamalan film, The Mist. It's got 
a very different ending, but the survivor's account that I'm drawing from to tell this story, it really spoke a lot about the mist itself, and there are some stark similarities for me. It was a peaceful evening on August 21st, 1986, and a man called Paulinus, a farmer near Lake Nios, he was winding down after a long day. This lake in particular is in Cameroon's mountainous region. It's beautiful, it has this kind of really quiet presence in the area as a whole. And there's this body of water that reflects the hills around it. It's really quite idyllic. Now, as Paulinus sat down with his family, he heard this kind of echoey sound coming from the lake. It wasn't even really that noticeable at first, but then almost instantly, things started to change. It was early evening when Paulinus heard a rumbling sound, like distant thunder almost. When he looked outside, he saw this dense white cloud rising up and coming downhill towards his home. The air suddenly felt thick and dense in a way that Paulinus had never experienced before. His vision then started to blur and he felt very dizzy. As he looked across the room, he noticed a number of his family members started slumping to the side. Beyond them, he saw another family member now lying on the floor, seemingly unconscious. Paulinus blinked his eyes, trying desperately to stay conscious himself, but all he could do was let himself slump down as well. His chest began to feel tight and he gasped for air. There was some kind of heavy pressure forcing his chest down and he was struggling to breathe. He needed to get out. Paulinus managed to get to the door and swung it open and then he stumbled through the now silent, eerie village. It really was like a ghost town. On his journey through, he saw neighbours lying motionless. He saw children, adults, everyone in between, and many of them had blood having seeped from their noses and from their mouths. There were even animals scattered about, as if they'd just collapsed on the spot. At this point, the air was filled with an overwhelming silence, and the only break in that was an occasional cough or gasp from someone who was still alive, but barely, and they were just trying to hold on to consciousness. Paulinus continued through the village, desperately trying to search for signs of, well, anyone alive. He did eventually make it to a group of people, and they were all gasping, they were all clearly very unwell, but importantly, they were also very clearly still alive. And so they gathered together and they all just stayed put and kind of waited. It was a few days later that help finally arrived. Rescuers found Paulinus and the other survivors, but there weren't many. 1,746 people had died and as many as 3,500 livestock had also perished. Paulinus would later describe the surreal nature of that night, how quiet it was, and how he could only stumble in confusion through the village as life just seemed to vanish around him. And there was complete confusion over what exactly had happened to cause mass casualty that day. Of course, an investigation was launched and investigating scientists managed to determine exactly what had happened, but it took a while because the thing that had happened when they arrived, had completely disappeared. Over time, many, many years, Lake Nios had slowly been gathering CO2 at its depths. And something had triggered this pressure to finally release after all those years. But what that meant was that all of this CO2 came up at once. It sent up this massive cloud that then rolled downhill and ultimately suffocated anything it came into contact with. Now, normally, CO2 is completely harmless when it's diffused into the air in really small amounts, but in this case, it was a very concentrated amount, and it was extremely deadly. The gas itself displaced all of the oxygen in the air, and it created kind of like an asphyxiation uh, blanket. It ended up smothering everything within a 16 mile radius of the lake. It really was quite big. To prevent another disaster like this from happening again, scientists ended up installing this uh, system into the lake that would help release CO2 more gradually over time. Paulinus and many of the other survivors faced really long-term trauma and health impacts because of this. And obviously they had to rebuild their lives without their family and friends, without the people of the village that they knew and loved. Thank you for joining me for this new episode of Red Rum. I hope that you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. Um, as always, I'm going to end on a bit of a recommendation for you. So this week I wanted to recommend Misery. I've been wanting to watch this for the longest time. 
Um, it's been recommended to me loads. It's a Stephen King, so you know it's going to be good. It's right up my street. Now, it's not a film that's going to blow your mind, but as psychological thrillers go, I just thought it was wicked. It stars Kathy Bates and James Kahn, and it's about this well-known author who he's basically abducted and held hostage by his obsessive fan. She calls herself his number one fan. Kathy Bates is phenomenal. I actually read that she won an Academy Award for this role. So it's definitely worth a watch just for her um, portrayal of this character in itself. The film builds suspense so well. You're really with the characters the entire way throughout it. And it presents this woman as your classic kind of unlikable, quote, crazy uh, woman. But you're so with her. You really want to to watch her. You don't necessarily want her to win, but you also kind of do. I think it's such a hard task to get that right, especially when you're not giving real backstory. We, we don't really tend to need that when we see stories of men, Patrick Bateman, for example, in American Psycho. We don't really question why he's like that, where he's come from, what his family life was like, why he is that way. And I think this film is a really good example of, I didn't do that when watching it, for this character. I think her name's Annie Wilkes. She just is who she is and we kind of just want to see that story play out. I think the story really holds the film up as do the acting performances. If you don't like gore, then, I mean, hi, true crime podcast. Um, but there are a couple of moments in this that, I mean, if you know, you know, they're pretty horrific, but they are so well done. Even if you don't like gore, it's probably worth a watch. Um, if you've seen it as a way, please let me know what you think. Um, and I won't even see you next week for an episode of Red Rum. I'll see you in a few days. So make sure you are subscribed with notifications on if you want to see more stuff like this. And if you want me to make more videos, please, please, please um, like, comment, subscribe, all of that stuff because it really does make a difference and it helps other people see the video, which is always exciting. And um, yeah, YouTube algorithm is weird. And I listened to this really interesting podcast recently um, about female YouTube content creators and how the algorithm kind of doesn't push them as much as it does men. Uh, I think in the top 50 YouTubers of all time, only three of them are women, which obviously is not representative of the population at all. Really interesting podcast. I'll link that below as well. Uh, but yeah, if you are able to do any of those things, um, to be honest, even if you're watching it to this point, that is so, so appreciated. So thank you for being here and I'll see you in a couple of days for another episode of Red Rum. Bye.